Hey there, welcome back to Practical Stoicism. I'm your host, Tanner Campbell, and in today's episode, we're having a discussion with Donald Robertson. I caught up with Donald while he was traveling. He's recently been to, geez, he's just all over the place. This guy is potentially one of the coolest dudes that I've ever come across, certainly within the realm of purveyors of stoicism. I mean, the guy has got things going on in Greece. He's got things going on in Canada. He's got things going on in the UK. He's got a really just wild background. And I think the reason that I appreciate him so much is that he reminds me, this is going to sound a little self-serving, but he reminds me of myself in that he was never afraid at any point to shrug off what was traditionally expected of him or to stick with something just because he had started something. And maybe that sounds bad, but what I really mean is he wasn't afraid to break away from something that was no longer serving him to chase something that was going to. And as somebody who has worked as a marketer, owned a recording studio, become an audio engineer, become a consultant to large business within media, and who recently broke away from all of that to become a full-time podcaster in the philosophy space and writer in the philosophy space, it's just great to know that I'm not the only psychopath out there who's willing to take those kinds of risks. And I think that Donald is a great example of why taking risks and making difficult decisions throughout the course of your life and kind of going where you think you need to go, and of course taking some good advice along the way, is incredibly critical to becoming the sort of person you want to become. Now that is not the focus of today's discussion, but I think you're going to see that throughout the course of it. The topic of the discussion surprisingly became about cognitive behavioral therapy which you may or may not be familiar with. We will talk about it in the episode, but I'm glad that that is what it became about because I'm a huge fan of CBT. I don't think I ever really understood why, but as a therapeutic modality, I always considered it to be the gold standard. And to find out that it has such deep roots in stoicism was a pleasant surprise. And we spend perhaps 50% or more of this discussion on CBT and on the history of psychoanalysis. And Donald is just a wealth of information in that area. We also, of course, talk about stoicism and about a couple of his books. And I just think this is a great conversation. And I know you're going to enjoy it. Again, I caught up with Donald while he was traveling, so you'll have to deal with the webcam audio on his end. It can get a little distorted at some portions, but try to get through that. The quality of the conversation easily makes suffering through webcam audio well worth it. And hey, you know what? Before we jump into the conversation, just I got to fit the reminder in that if you'd like to get rid of ads, you can become a premium subscriber at stoicism.supercast.com. That's all I'll say. I promise. Now, here's my discussion with Donald Robertson. Donald, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and chat. You have got a lot going on to include the building of a new conference center in Greece at the site of the original Plato Academy. And that's just insane. Uh, So thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much for inviting me. Can we maybe start with that? Because it blew me away when you said you were doing that. I thought, God, what a cool and absolutely historical thing to be doing. Talk a little bit about it. I've been spending time in Greece for a few years now, and I have my permanent residence there. And I would explore all the archaeological sites. I'd go there to do uh, research on books and stuff. And uh, one of them is Academia Platanos, the suburb where Plato's Academy was located. So I w- went there, and I thought it was weird. I couldn't find very much about it on the internet. No one mentioned it much, and I went. There's not many tourists go there. It's mainly locals, and there's a big park. So in ancient Greece, there were these recreational grounds where they did sports and stuff, and um, maybe 20, 30 acres or something like that. There's not much left of the Lyceum, Aristotle's school, and the, the grounds where that was located. But Plato's school is still a public park. It's pretty big. And there are ruins of several buildings there. It's just that it's not something that's kind of really advertised to tourists much. So the Athenians call it a dog park, which kind of freaks me out a little bit um, when I think about how important it is historically. So it's, it's kind of been neglected in a way, largely. And so I thought, why? Because I run a lot of events and stuff. My natural automatic thought was, why isn't there a conference centre or something here? 
it's it's weird and why is this not used for anything and i thought if someone told me there was a conference center adjacent to the original location of plato's academy and there's a, a big park there and stuff i definitely want to run an event there and then i started talking to the speakers that i know and other people that are involved in events and i said would you want to run an event at the original location of plato's academy and everybody was like hell yeah and then <laughs> like people started offering me money and then people wanted to kind of help with the project. And so it just kind of exploded somehow. About a year ago, we uh, we incorporated in Greece as a non-profit. We have a board of advisors with a bunch of academics and authors on it. We work very closely with the American School for Classical Studies in Athens. And uh, yeah, we've got support from the mayor of Athens and uh, several Greek government ministers. And it, it went a bit crazy. You also told me that this might start with a smaller building before it comes to the thing, becomes the thing that you truly envision. But you also mentioned that there's a chance that Plato may actually be buried at this site, and there's the potentiality of perhaps discovering that. I think he's probably still there. Yeah, I mean, his remains are probably you know like disintegrated or whatever. But he he was buried underground in the park. Um, he had a tomb that stood there. We know what the inscriptions were the epitaphs on his tomb and yeah like the how far along is the project uh we started off running virtual events and we're about to run our third one we've had about 1500 people that attended the previous ones we recently collaborated with some other organizations in running a four-day in-person event it was the first one that we've done kind of uh since the start of the pandemic and we ran it mainly outdoors in the park and stuff. It was a big kind of, you know, first of a kind of event in a way. Um, they don't usually run big events like that in the in the park. Yeah, like we're looking at, I have a guy, my friend who's a chartered surveyor, is looking at properties at the moment in Athens. We've been sort of working on that for a while. We may acquire a smaller property first to use as a centre and then use that as a stepping stone to uh, creating a, a proper conference facility there. But that's how far along we are. We started running virtual events to get the event side of things going first, and then we're looking at acquiring. We've got acquiring the properties a bit of a longer term project, but we started work on that. As if this were not enough to be going on, because I think if I was in the process of attempting to build a conference center in Greece when I lived in where you live, Canada, that that would be enough for me. I, I would have a full plate. But you've also just released a brand new graphic novel with a very talented, um, I think it was Portuguese illustrator. And it's all about the life, legacy, death, childhood of Marcus Aurelius and introduces people, I think, quite smoothly to the philosophy of Stoicism. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about it, what the onus for creating it was or, or what made you want to create it, and a little bit about the process, because you've never done a graphic novel before, uh, and I imagine there were a lot of things to learn in, in taking something like that on. I kind of joke about this because, like, you know, the process of doing a book proposal can sometimes be quite extensive. We had a lot of discussions about it. And then uh, I started work on it, and I thought, at no point has anyone ever asked me if I've ever read a graphic novel. Like, and uh, I, I don't think I, I hadn't probably. Maybe I'd read like one or two like when I was a student or whatever. Luckily, I read a lot of comics. I read 2000 AD, this uh, British comic that, um, uh, you know, the Judge Dredd and things like that come from. I read it religiously when I was a teenager. But I'm not really into comics, um, and I hadn't read many graphic novels I just kind of stumbled into doing this because they Zay, the artist, approached me and we first of all did some web comics and then I printed the Gicli or high quality like fine art uh, prints of some of the panels from the web comics that he did and I showed them at a Stoicism conference in London and an editor saw them from a major publisher. And which is so it's a cute, it's a pretty cool way. I'd never thought of that as a strategy for getting a book deal. So, like, I tell everyone about this now. I was like, you know, we accidentally got a book deal just by showing these like pictures at a conference. And I, I didn't, I hadn't thought that there were people that work in publishing at the event, of, like, but I, I kind of should have known that. And so, this guy said, Do you want to do a graphic novel about it? And we got in discussions about it. And uh, I ended up doing it with my own publisher, Macmillan, St. Martin's. And yeah, I did a lot of research on uh, how to 
I can, I'm the sort of guy, if I don't know how to do something, then I kind of feel a bit of a responsibility. And so I thought, I better go and learn how to do graphic novels. So I started off by reading a bunch, and then I felt that wasn't really working for me. And so instead what I did was watch loads of movies and TV series about sod and sandal stuff, like ancient Roman, ancient Greece, and other ancient cultures, and kind of look at the shots and stuff and try and get inspiration from that. And I also read a whole, there are a surprising number of books about how to write a graphic novel. The best one is Scott McLeod's book, Making Comics, I think it's called, which I read cover to cover like two or three times. That's awesome. That was like my Bible. So I, I actually learned a lot about the art of doing graphic novels and script writing for them and stuff. And I got good advisors. And, uh, you know, I, it ended up being a kind of cinematic style of graphic novel. That was because I couldn't be bothered reading other graphic novels and I'd rather watch movies instead for inspiration. So like I ended up watching all these movies and that's the graphic novel ends up looking like a movie. Um, and kind of the script is kind of like a movie script, I think. And by the end of it, I thought I've accidentally written the prequel to Gladiator. That wasn't the plan, but I thought, oh yeah, it's kind of like prequel to Gladiator. That's where it emerges. Look like, but with a lot more stoicism in it. Yeah, oh, sure. There, there may be a movie deal that you'll accidentally get as well. <laughs> you accidentally get a movie deal. The guy who's writing the script for Gladiator 2 has read How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. I'm reliably informed as part of his research. Why? So it, you, it's possible. This is interesting, right? This is something that I noticed or that I realized about you as I read something that you sent me earlier this morning or last night. I just got to it this morning, and it was basically this write-up of kind of your history, your childhood, where you come from. You come from very modest means. You yourself seem to be a man of very modest means in general, or at least you project that. How is this success with these things? Does it feel weird to you? Was it weird at first? Has it become normal? I mean... Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to pretend that I'm poor, although I was for a lot of my life. But I kind of live out of a suitcase, and that's mainly because I travel a lot. But um, maybe one day I'll end up owning owning a lot of stuff. But for a long time, I everything I owned um, would fit in a suitcase. All my books were like on Kindle and stuff like that. And I had like I'd say to people, I only have one jacket and like one pair of shoes, and like you know, uh, I live to. I didn't even think of myself as a minimalist. I just accidentally ended up living, I guess, a very minimalist life. Um, so I was moving around a lot and stuff. And I'd, I guess for a long time, I'd been a student when I was younger and I got used to kind of living. I've never owned a car. Um, you know, I just kind of live in a pretty basic way. I eat pretty simply. So, yeah, I do get to travel a lot. But weird, the cool thing about that is that when you do public speaking and you're a writer, I'm always invited to go places. So a lot of my travel is kind of paid for. I, I go to speak at a conference in Belgium or something or somewhere like that. And, you know, I'll stay for like a month. I won't leave. I'll just go and I won't leave. <laughs> I'll just kind of like stay for a while. And that's kind of where I, when I was going to Athens, I, I went sometimes for events and things like that. And I thought, I'll just stay for like a few months because I kind of like it here. So, yeah, I... I came from a relatively poor family. Um, you know, my mother was a cleaner and uh, my father passed away when I was pretty young. And yeah, like I, as a kid, you know, the prospects for me were pretty limited in air. Um, this is before the internet, obviously. So if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, like, and you live in a small town, like and it's only really got one or two main businesses there. It just seems conceivable that you go, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Like because how would you like you know how would you even begin to contact people or learn about that? So I guess people did it back then, but it seems far far easier now with the internet. And uh, so I was lucky. I ended up at university studying philosophy, and then I travelled to London and I became a therapist and I kind of stumbled into various things. I was felt moderately successful as I had a Harley street clinic for many years. And then I, I immigrated to Canada and I became more, I, I was a writer and I ended up becoming a full-time writer. And uh, that graphic novel is, has just come out. But since that, I also wrote another book, which is pending publication, which is, a biography, a prose biography of Marcus Aurelius for Yale University Press. So I've actually written three books in a row now, 
about Marcus Aurelius, which is one of the things that happens. You end up getting asked to write about the same thing. You mentioned that you live minimally, almost by accident, that you live out of, out of a suitcase, that you didn't have that much for a long time, that you eat a very, you know, kind of small, regular, normal diet, nothing really grand. Is that intentional or is that a side effect of the traveling and the lifestyle that you live? Because Stoicism does talk about keeping an easy diet and, you know, speaking plainly and all of these things are part of Stoicism. I'll be honest about it. I think, you know, you, you can tell when someone's being honest about something like this because they'll give you the, the following answer. They'll say, I don't know. It's just what I do. And I guess it's probably a combination of things. I'm guessing like reading all these books about stoicism has kind of influenced me a bit in that direction. And then some of it is just me and maybe my back, you know, the background that I've got and, and stuff. I do occasionally. I had a pizza last night. Because it's like, but usually my kind of go-to thing is I'll just make Greek salad every day and I drink black coffee and you know, like I'm kind of boring like that. But yeah, I think it fit, it's probably, that's probably been reinforced by the Stoic philosophy. Stoicism is fundamentally a, a non-materialistic philosophy. It tells us that, I guess you could say one of the most basic things that we can take from Stoicism is that the Stoics tell us, hey, have you noticed that most people are way too preoccupied with money? and you know are are kind of too hung up on what other people think of them and their reputation and stuff like that and the stoic philosophers tell us you need to kind of see through that buddy like if you're if we're going to get anywhere um that's a very you know simplified version but that is pretty central to stoicism it encourages us to be less materialistic less uh, egotistical um and to see through these kind of prevailing values in society, it was the same in ancient society. In a sense, it's the same today. Like there are maybe even reasons for that, but you know, people typically fall into this trap of you know wanting more and more and more. Like, and whereas the, the Stoics thought we should be training ourselves to be satisfied uh, with fewer and fewer material things, so that's really the path to freedom. To me, it is fascinating that this problem has existed forever that people have always been trying to keep up with the Joneses, that people have always been trying to grow more wealth. Of course, this is not necessarily true in every culture. It is very prevalent in Western culture, but it exists in Eastern culture, and uh, we could say Aboriginal cultures as well, but nowhere near to the degree, I think, that it does in Western culture. It has led over time, and maybe anxiety existed as a type of psychosis or a form of psychosis in ancient Greece, but maybe nobody could have called it that. Today, I think we see a massive rise in anxiety amongst everyday people, it's it's a real it's a real problem. Uh, I would call it a pandemic. Certainly, you at some point became a psychotherapist far before you started writing anything about stoicism formally. We talked a little bit before this discussion about wanting to touch on the connection between stoicism and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and, but not just the rather well-known connections, the lesser well-known connections. Can, can we dive into that? And before we do, I, I just wanted to mention the World Health Organization says that clinical depression is an epidemic. Like, so like literally, we, we, it's, it's a kind of silent, kind of hidden epidemic in a way you might say, um, but it's pretty serious. And in the UK in particular, I think perhaps more so than in other countries where, where I came from, like mental health is taken very seriously from that perspective. The government commissioned a, a report into it that found that it was more in the country's economic interests to train an army of psychotherapists and CBT to treat depression than it was just to prescribe pills for it so that really permeated Britain, the the nhs in britain and and the culture in britain i think more than it has america shock horror i'm going to say something kind of unusual and shocking here i think america is roughly 10 or 20 years behind the uk um surprisingly like in in terms of mental health um so the relationship between stoicism and, and cbt i guess that it relates to that a little bit because um, psychotherapy has been around in the modern world since actually the middle of the 19th century because the first psychotherapists really were guys doing hypnosis like Hippolyte Bernheim and James Braid and these guys. Oh, that's interesting because most people would think of it, Freud as being somehow the father of psychotherapy. You're saying that that's not true. It's early. Yeah, but most people are wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. Like, well, it's true. Most people think Freud was the first psychotherapist, and they're wrong about that. Like, Freud's trained in psychotherapy under Pierre Charcot, 
um, in Paris and also uh, under Hippolyte Bernheim. They're kind of hypnotic psychotherapy that also used bits of Socratic questioning as well. And then he kind of developed his own thing at the end of the 19th century. And Freudian psychoanalysis dominated in some shape or form, and its derivatives dominated psychotherapy for most of the, the 20th century every, everywhere except in the former Soviet Union, where they were not taken in by it and thought that the whole thing was pseudoscientific mumbo-jumbo, interestingly. And so the uh, the Soviets were much more into Pavlov and conditioned reflexes, and, and they were one of the inspirations for subsequent behavior therapy in the in the US, which came to dominate from roughly the nineteen sixties onward. And that spawned out of behavior therapy, we get cognitive therapy, or what we typically call cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Cognitive therapy and behavior therapy are very closely associated to both heavily research-based or evidence-based approaches to psychotherapy, which Freud was not. Freud never did any research whatsoever in his entire life on psychotherapy, surprisingly. He was quite anti-science, I would argue. And although he often talks about science and stuff in his actions, he was the contrary. He was was pretty anti-science, anti-research. One of the pioneers of cognitive therapy was a guy called Albert Ellis, who, like many people in the 1950s, had been a psychoanalytic therapist and got disillusioned with it. And so he did a really cool thing that I always admire people for doing. He kind of ripped everything up and started again from scratch. He went, I've had it with this. It's just not working for me. And he he said, I'm going to start again from scratch. And he tried to figure out a whole different approach to psychotherapy. He thought, this Freudian stuff's just not working. Like, you know, what, what would be a... If I was going to begin again, what would I do? And he'd read the Stoics. He particularly read Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, not so much Seneca. And he developed a form of therapy called rational emotive behavior therapy, or at least that's where it ended up becoming known as, or REBT, which is the main precursor, or if you like, the earliest form of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, back in the middle of the 1950s. And it's based on something we call the cognitive model of emotion, like, so I'll talk a little bit, I'll, I'll do a bit of a dive into that because I think it's so important. So when clients come into therapy, they'll usually, in the initial assessment session, talk about the problem. And they'll talk about the impact or consequences of the problem for their quality of life. So they'll say, hey, I've got panic attacks and they're making me physically ill, I'm not sleeping properly um it's affecting my ability to function i don't go out as much it's destroying my relationships it's making harder for me to do my job at work like and it's getting worse and worse as time goes on so it's affecting me all these different levels and all these different ways that the client will say whether it's anxiety or depression or anger or whatever it is they're presenting and implicitly while they're doing that what they're actually doing is giving themselves what's sometimes called an annoyance review. So they're giving themselves like a list of reasons to change the behavior. And they, people sense that. So they usually get to a point um, where having talked about the horrible damage that their anxiety, anger, or depression is doing to their life, they'll then kind of look frustrated and they'll say, you know, I, it's just like, I know I need to do something about this. Um, I know I need to change because it's destroying my life, but I can't help it. It's just the way I feel. So that's an expression of stuckness, as we sometimes describe it. I've got to do something. I've got all these reasons why I need to do something about this. I'm desperate to do it, but I feel that I can. Like, I can't help it. It's just the way I feel. And Ellis would lean forward and smile at them at that point and say, yeah, but it's not just how you feel, is it? It's also how you think. And that is of seismic importance. We call it the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy. Right, Freud would say, "Oh yeah, you're probably right. You should lie on a couch and tell me about your dreams for the next five years." Right? Ella said, "No, this is how. This is not just how you feel. It's also how you think because your feelings are derivatives of certain thoughts in a pretty straightforward way. So if you're anxious, right, it doesn't come from nowhere. Like in part, your anxiety probably, in most cases." is derived from the belief that something terrible is going to happen. It's prob- there's a high probability it's going to happen. High, it's going to have a high severity for you and that you have a low appraisal of your ability to cope with it. We can analyze even the structure 
of the beliefs that cause different emotions, right? And we know that with people with anxiety disorders tend to uh, exaggerate the probability and severity of field catastrophes and to underestimate their coping ability. So they're maybe wrong about a lot of the beliefs that are causing their anxiety or their depression or anger. And as soon as you acknowledge that those are thoughts or beliefs, uh, beliefs, unlike feelings, have a propositional content or truth value, if you like. They can be true or false. They can be accurate or slightly inaccurate. So that opens up, boom, a toolbox of cognitive therapy techniques. That's, you know, I don't think most people understand how important Ellis leaning forward and saying it's not just how you feel was to the history of psychotherapy. It's also how you think, because thoughts can be questioned and challenged rationally using the Socratic method. And Ellis cast around, like, the, there was a lot of research at the time to support the co- experimental studies that supported the cognitive model of emotion. Um, and Ellis was also influenced by emerging research in the field of psychotherapy. But he, all psychotherapists do something that's similar to public health. Like they, we work directly with the general public and we have to take, all evidence-based psychotherapists have to take research that's really technical, that you train for years at postgraduate level to be able to interpret, like that uses advanced inferential statistics and a lot of technical medical jargon. And then we have to sit down in front of an old Jewish lady, a guy that drives a double-decker bus in London, a 15-year-old kid that's bunking off school, like or whoever, whatever random person walks through the door that we're working with, and translate that research into language that they can understand and find relevant. And Ellis, casting around for a way to do that, thought, how can I explain the cognitive models of emotion to these random like psychotherapy clients. And he thought, you know what? There's a quote from this philosopher called Epictetus. So it says, it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. And people went, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. And they also went, basically that's what the research tells us as well. Right, he was right about that. But this was, he said this like 2000 years ago. And so Ellis taught that quotation to all of his clients. And he saw far ellis must have seen way more clients Freud only saw 50 clients in his whole career incidentally ellis saw hundreds and hundreds like thousands of clients he was a workaholic um and he taught them all that quote he taught all his students his trainees in psychotherapy that quote and he he wrote many 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 books and he mentions that quote from epictetus and most of them so by the time i came to train in cbt that quote from epictetus was kind of a cliche that every cognitive behavioral therapist had had read or heard what surprised me and i didn't realize at first i thought wow all these cbt practitioners must be into stoicism and then i realized that that was the only quote from the stoics that they were familiar with ellis had read the stoics and he mentions them in many different ways but he's virtually the only cbt author that does and so stoicism had shared this fundamental premise with cbt and so they they had many things in common um, and it also had many other, it, it influenced Ellis in many other ways, but most CBT practitioners were unaware of the debt that they had uh, to stoicism. And so I became fascinated with that and began researching it. We are going to take a short break here. When we come back, I want to talk a bit about the differences between CBT and let's say competing modalities of psychotherapy or therapy in general, because I think that a lot of my listeners have probably explored therapy, have probably heard the initial CBT, have probably heard bad things about it, good things about it, conflicting things. And I think it would be useful to go through that. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Back with Donald Robertson talking about psychotherapy and CBT and also stoicism and his book, Verissimus. We'll get back to talking more about the book, but I want to continue into this discussion about cognitive behavioral therapy and some alternatives to it. Donald, let's let's talk about that. Well, I trained initially uh, not in CBT, but in psychodynamic therapy. I studied Freud. My master's degree is in psychoanalytic theory. So I was a total nerd about the history of psychoanalysis and Freud. And um, Freud's basic idea was that our problems are symbolic in nature, that if you have anxiety, it's the expression of a repressed desire. 
um, in symbolic form. And you're oblivious to that. It's repressed, as he said, and you're unconscious, which weirdly means that you have to go and ask someone else to interpret it for you, a psychoanalyst, like, which sounds kind of interesting and plausible. And Freud wrote his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, which goes into great detail about how to interpret these. And it turns out that all of our mental health symptoms, pretty much, according to Freud, boil down to the Oedipus complex. You want to sleep with your mum, like, and you're frightened that your dad is going to castrate you. He wasn't sure how that applied to women, incidentally, but he thought in some version of it must apply to women. Women, he thought, had penis envy, maybe. And so Freud had this model of interpretation. And, uh, you know, you might read that, like people in the Soviet Union did, and think, that sounds like total hogwash. Perhaps you might look at it and think, what was this based on? Did he do some sort of research to arrive at this conclusion? No, he just made it up. It's it's armchair like uh, psychology. He interpreted his own dreams after his father passed away and came to the conclusion that he wanted to sleep with his mother and was frightened his dad would castrate him. And then he thought, hang on a minute, but everyone else is exactly the same, basically. That's about the extent of Freud's research, right? I mean, I don't know about you, Donald, but that's absolutely how I feel. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't we, don't we all? Like, but that, that was what, I mean, Freud had a weird relationship with his mother that I won't go into anyway, but like that, it may be a reflection of his odd upbringing and, and circumstances in life. And then he... He was surrounded by other people like Carl Jung, who then split off from him. So you, you like you could say, look, this is dubious to begin with, but it became hugely. Everyone knows how big Freud was, right? He's one of the great minds of allegedly, like, um, of modernity, right? Uh, everyone still knows his name. Um, and then he had a bunch of followers like Adler and. Um, also Rank and Jung and all, all these guys, endless psychoanalysts, right? And they all started to think, geez, I need to get a book out too. So they thought, I kind of agree with Freud, but I think anxiety is really, Otto Rank said, repressed birth trauma. And uh, Jung said, well, I think it's really, you know, got more to do with uh, mythological symbols and lack of integration. Uh, Klein said it's... Um, got to do with your relationship with your mother's breast uh, and that being repressed. Uh, Adler said it's inferiority. So they, there were all these psychoanalysts. So now you've got a problem, right? So you have, um, they can't all be right because they've all got competing models of interpretation, but they could all be wrong. So now you have uh, this mess like of all these competing models of interpretation because the reason being that none of them are based on any real research right like so it's kind of like just throwing spaghetti at the wall like let's see what sticks and then carl rogers the founder of what we call the humanistic tradition in the 50s came along and said well what if you just ask the client to interpret it themselves and you, you don't really give it what if we throw out all these books but we do something kind of similar, like, and the therapist is just a sounding board to reflect things back to the, the client uh, by paraphrasing what they say and asking them questions for clarification and stuff. And we let them figure it out and interpret it. And the Rogerian said, yeah, this is about as effective as what the, all these other psychoanalysts are doing. And we don't have any model of interpretation at all, which would be shocking because it could mean you could take entire, you could fill entire libraries with these books about psychoanalysis, and if, if Carl Rogers is right, you could pretty much burn them all. Like You could flush them down the toilet because they're not really contributing anything to the outcome of the therapy. Well, what's interesting here is that what you're talking about, what year is this that this starts to happen when we start to suggest that people just be a sounding board? What year is that? From about the 1950s. So what's really interesting is that there seems to be a sudden fracturing of people who are basing their psychoanalysis or their psychotherapy or just therapy in general on this idea that is non-empirical and then empirical, which seems to perhaps it's led to what we have today with, you know, crystal healing and all that. And, and those people seem diametrically opposed at all times to anything that the other side, the empirically driven side would suggest. Is that, Am I seeing that correctly? Yeah, but there's, there's, I should say there's like a straightforward kind of historical explanation for part of what happened here, which is the Second World War, because the Nazis didn't like psychoanalysis because it was mainly Jewish, with the exception of Carl Jung, who joined the Nazi party. Well, I, I know Carl Jung's followers get quite upset about that, but like, well, let's set aside Carl Jung's 
murky reputation. Um, but Jung um, broke with Freud and the other Jewish psychoanalysts, and they fled the Nazis. And Jung came to London and settled uh, there. But mo- many of the psychoanalysts went to America, where the dominant approach to psychology was behaviorism at the time. So they kind of suddenly w- was this um, influx of continental psychoanalytic thinkers talking to behavioral psychologists, and that led to this very eclectic period in the history of psychotherapy when people were exchanging ideas. And of course, that meant everyone kind of, you know, breaking out of their previous limited assumptions. There's a period of immense creativity. And the human what's called the humanistic tradition in psychotherapy kind of emerges from this. It was a bit of a, it became a little bit of a free for all. And you get a, suddenly hundreds of different approaches to psychotherapy. Well, what does that mean, the humanistic approach? Just so I'm not assume I don't know, and I don't want to assume anybody else does. Well, we typically say there are three main traditions in the history of psychotherapy. One is the cognitive behavioral tradition. One is the humanistic tradition, and the other is um, the psychoanalytic, psychodynamic tradition that goes back to Freud. And the humanistic tradition um, was typically also an insight-oriented approach. It was about helping people to gain an insight into the meaning of their symptoms, but it placed more emphasis on them interpreting their own experience. And so Carl Rogers was one. Gestalt therapy is kind of similar in that regard. Existential therapy is kind of broadly aligned with that way of thinking. Um, and they, these approaches um, were less directly drawing on psychological research. They drew more kind of on philosophy, if you like, to often the phenomenology and existentialism. Um, and then the cognitive behavioral tradition was kind of distinguished to not entirely but to a large extent by the fact that it was drawing more directly on emerging psychological research into the emotions and research on psychopathology and more empirical in nature so those are the kind of competing models of psychotherapy i trained in lots of approaches i, I trained in reviewing counseling i trained in psychodynamic therapy i studied Lacan and klein and freud and I, I became disillusioned with it as well for a bunch of reasons. And so I kind of a little bit like Ellis. Maybe that's why I'm, I'm drawn to him. Halfway through my psychodynamic training, having done a, a master's in psychoanalytic theory, I kind of woke up one day as a result of various experiences and just thought, I quit. My, I'm done with this. Like, I need to... It was a big upheaval. Like, um, I, I have to start again from scratch. And I know this will offend people who are psychoanalytic, psychodynamic therapists, but I'll say it anyway, because this is an expression of my personal experience. For me personally, it, I, it really did feel like getting out of a cult. Um, that's how I experienced quitting psychodynamic training. Um, because you're not allowed, to, traditionally, psychoanalytic therapists kind of try to stop their clients leaving the therapy. So you, 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 when you're training, you have to be in training analysis as well. So you go and see a, a psychoanalytic therapist. And if you say, ah, I'm done with all this, I quit, they say, oh, I wonder why you feel that way and what does it mean? And does it have something to do with your unconscious relationship with your parents and we should spend more time and you think well this is never ending then it's a, so we have to interpret your desire to quit the therapy so you should stay on for like more sessions to do that you think well that makes it impossible to ever quit the therapy like, this becomes like a kind of cult or something then so for a bunch of reasons i think like many people i've met who have been through a similar process one was it i didn't feel it was benefiting me personally i didn't feel that it was benefiting my clients and I also felt the stuff that we studied in the psychodynamic approach was contradicted by a, a, a lot of research in the field of psychology. Um, it didn't seem like a coherent or plausible um, theory or practice to me anymore. Um, so I woke up one day and reluctantly I kind of thought I'm going to have to quit all of this stuff, start again from scratch and like Ellis, I thought stoicism seems to work for me. Like, and it seems more consistent in many ways uh, with what we know about how emotions actually work and how therapy actually works. 
And so I became very interested in the relationship between Stoicism and cognitive behavioural therapy from that point onward. I think the Stoics acknowledge that we can benefit from Stoic teachers. And in fact, I think in, in some ways we get a slightly distorted view of what Stoicism looked like in practice today, because all the Stoics are dead, unfortunately, right? And by the way, I hate to break that to people if they like, but they're all dead. And um, the ancient Stoics, we know, um, believed the the best way to learn Stoicism was by hanging out with a mentor. Um, and we also know that they didn't really have a kind of hierarchical, just as a slight aside about that, the, the Stoics are not called, the Stoics were originally called the Zenonians, which I'm glad that they're not called anymore because it sounds super weird. Right? It sounds like the Venusians or Martians or something like that. Like the, so they were called the Zenonians after Zeno, the founder of the school, but they quickly abandoned that name and called themselves after the Stoapoikale, the, the public space where they met. Now, that's relatively unusual because most of the ancient schools of philosophy typically were known after their founder, we, the, we, you know, they do have other names as well. But Aristotelians were called Aristotelian, Epicureans were called Epicurean, uh, Platonists were called Platonists, but like, Zenonians are not called Zenonians. And I think that's partly because Zeno denied that he was perfectly wise. And uh, we sadly, we don't know more about his reasons for doing that. However, there's a passage in Seneca which... I speculate, reflects why Zeno said this. Seneca, talking to Lucilius, said, do not approach me like an expert or like a patient talking to a physician, but rather view me as a fellow patient in the hospital bed beside you who has simply been undergoing treatment for longer and can share his experience of what it's like to undergo that treatment. But I'm not like a claiming uh, to be an expert on therapy is how he puts it and i think that because none of the stoics claim to be perfectly wise unlike epicurus for example um they what they are describing is not so much like a patient client relationship um but more like a kind of peer support group like alcoholics anonymous funnily enough like in a, a number of ways you would have a mentor an aa a sponsor um and it may be somebody who's recovering from alcoholism you know but admits their own fallibility but just has, has maybe been going through the process for longer that's very similar to what seneca describes when he describes the relationship between uh the two stoics and so the stoics wrote books on on psychotherapy like they believed that we needed to find a community and mentors and that that was much more valuable than reading books about stoicism so i don't think that the stoics would say that we could do it all on our own there's also a passage in marcus aurelius where he says if you have to ask for help you shouldn't be ashamed to do so he said any and he compares it to a soldier who's wounded in the in the heat of a battle asking one of his comrades to give him a leg up and climbing over the battlements to storm uh, a besieged city. And he said, you know, you'd admire that guy for, he said, I can't go over the wall. Can you give me a hand to get over? I want to keep, I want to keep fighting. I want to keep going. Like, you know, so, you know, rather than giving up, he's asking, he, he recognizes that he can benefit from help and he's asking for help where he needs it. Now, I think you're right in the sense that in Epictetus, he places so much emphasis on personal autonomy that sometimes it comes across like Epictetus thinks that we have complete freedom to control our minds. And it's and it is more so that in the modern world there's this kind of and I can't remember who coined it, it may have been Massimo, this kind of broicism. Yeah. Which is an interpretation of Stoicism that isn't, you know, this is what frat boys think about what Stoicism is, which is do it yourself or you're a, or you're a wuss, right? I see. And then you're kind of like looking down on people who would need therapy or help or whatever. But they're also wrong. We can chalk that up to adding them to the list of people who are wrong about stuff and and but nevertheless talk a lot about it online particularly. So, yeah, I, I let me say this. The internet is awash with misinformation about everything but you know and i hate i also hate to break that to people if they've not heard about this but a lot of the stuff on the internet is wrong so you will find people saying that the, the internet is full of bogus quotes from ancient philosophers for a start 
like, you know, there's a lot of articles and podcasts and things about stoicism that just get it completely wrong and end up saying stuff that's like directly the opposite of things that the ancient Stoics actually said. Um, so for sure, I mean, the, the, some of the, the bad interpretations of Stoicism come from people who have never actually read and will sometimes admit that they've never actually read any books on the subject, which seems crazy, right? But there are people out there who, I, and I think that's partly because, and this sounds absurd, like often when with people on the internet, you know, you know that meme that says, not sure if stupid or trolling or whatever, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the Futurama meme. Yeah, yeah the thing about people is that sometimes you're not, like, sometimes you'll get two people that say exactly the same thing, and one of them is kind of joking and being sarcastic and trolling, and the other one actually believes it, right? And it's it's really hard, sometimes impossible to tell them apart. But people say things about stoicism that are so stupid and so wildly inaccurate that you you kind of think you feel patronizing having to kind of correct them because you think like are, are you serious like but the, the stuff that's so way off the mark and a lot of it comes from people so ma- ma- many different names for ancient greek philosophies uh are used today in a different sense so we talk about someone being an epicurean today if we mean that they enjoy fine dining mm, right But that's got nothing to do with Epicurean philosophy, right? The meaning has become degraded over time. So really, like the dictionary definition of a lowercase Epicurean is something completely different. The ancient Epicureans ate very simple food. They tried to simplify their their diet. Um, We talk about someone being a cynic today with a lowercase c, if they're just really negative um, and, and think the worst of other people. And that's very tenuously related to what, capital C cynicism, the philosophy meant in ancient Greece. The same goes for sceptic, sophist, academic, and many other terms from ancient philosophy. Their meaning has become changed and degraded. So to to show that, we normally, when we're talking about the ancient philosophy, we would capitalise it. Like, And when we're using it in the kind of loose modern sense, we write it lowercase. So the same is true of, very much of Stoicism. So we talk about People say, oh, Queen Elizabeth was very stoic. Or they'll say, uh, what's his name? Mr. Spock of Star Trek. I mean, emotionless and having a stiff upper lip. And they, that's lowercase stoicism, which is kind of inspired by, over centuries by the concept of ancient stoicism. But it's a completely different thing, right? And I think a lot of the BS on the internet and misinformation actually does just boil down to people not understanding that these are two different words like, and they mean different things. Because you will literally get people saying that they're experts on Stoicism who and admitting that they've never read any books on the subject, which if you're talking about the capitalist or like the ancient philosophy, just is absurd. Like, I mean, that seems completely preposterous, right? How could you be an expert on a bunch of books that you haven't read? That'd be like, I'm an expert in Shakespeare, but I've never read any of his books or seen any of his plays. Like, that would just seem like a comical thing to say. So I think what they mean is that they think they're experts on having stiff, a stiff upper lip and, and lowercase stoicism. And maybe they assume that that's the same thing as what's written in all the books that they haven't read, which would also seem like a comical assumption to make, right? Like, I'm assuming that's the same as what's in all these books I haven't read. Like, seems like a joke. Right, but there are loads of people on the internet that, that that seems to be their stance, and that's where a lot of the confusion seems to come from. This is something I actually have mentioned a few times on the podcast. That first, I'm not an expert, and God, I was hoping in the middle of what you were just saying, you weren't going to say like your show. <laughs> You've definitely read the books, though, right? Like, which like, we're, so we're talking about people. I don't have anything, and the ancient Stoics wouldn't have anything against like people that don't have a philosophy degree, for instance, right. or, or people that haven't, that don't read Greek or Latin or, or haven't kind of like read every, t- as long as you, you've got the general idea of what ancient Stoicism is about and you're trying to apply it, Epictetus would be all over that. You know, are you t- no one in their right mind who's read Epictetus would think that he, he's, he, he goes on and on criticizing his students for being academic snobs, right? 
And you, are you telling me that if someone walked into Epictetus' school and they said, I've been learning the basics of Stoicism and I'm trying to really live in accord with him, he'd be like, get out of here until you finish reading Chris Ipus. Oh, hey, you need to learn Greek and Latin as well. I'm not interested. Epictetus is like, no, show me your shoulders. Like, show me that you're changing your character. You know, but you, you know, as long as you've got a rough idea of what Stoic philosophy actually is, which you do have, and these, these guys that we're talking about, at least some of them don't. Like, they just think, and by the way, I just want to mention one thing, I guess, to, to wrap that thought up. The reason that this is so important is that in modern psychology and in health research, we have several tools for measuring lowercase stoicism, such as one of them is called the Liverpool Stoicism Scale, for instance. And so there are many studies that demonstrate that people who score high on lowercase stoicism, which I could technically define as a coping style that consists in su- suppressing or concealing unpleasant or embarrassing emotions. Mm, which is bad. Yeah. It, we know that it's toxic, right? We know, and here's, I'll dig even deeper into this, right? The, we know that ironic, I could explain multiple reasons why we know it's toxic, right? But ironically, people who score high on lowercase stoicism think that they're strong. And it, it's kind of a machismo, an egotistical thing. They think that doing that makes them strong. I have, whereas ironically, what the research shows us is that they're weak individuals because they're prone to, they're more prone than average to developing clinical anxiety or depressive disorders. So in the sense that they're more vulnerable than the average person, whereas they think they're less vulnerable. Like they're achieving the opposite of what they they think they're doing. And so the research shows that low-key stoicism is bad for your mental health, whereas capitalist stoicism, we know uh, partly from direct research on it now, but also because it inspired CBT, which huge volumes of research support, we know that capitalist stoicism is typically good for your mental health. So we would be in hot water if we were dumb enough to confuse something that is known to be bad for mental health with something that's known to be good for mental health, then we'd be in a real mess. No, oh, then, then we'd be in a real mess. Not we might already be in that mess. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, we're already in that mess. Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying before was that I'll, I'll sometimes refer to taking philosophy out of the lab and trying to give it to someone who's not, and this sounds like a snobby thing to say, I don't mean it this way, but who's not intellectually prepped to deal with what you're sharing with them in the way they should deal with it. And I think that that is part, that's probably the biggest reason why there's been this proliferation of lowercase s stoicism being confused for capital S stoicism. And it's it's been a real tragedy, I agree. So we're going to take one last break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about this event that you've got going on in December that I think might be free, but I'm going to edit that out if not, and we'll learn more about that. So stay with us. And we're back with Donald Robertson talking about barely, really, his book, Verissimus, his new graphic novel, uh, but mostly about cognitive behavioral therapy and ways of coping with anxiety and stress, which has been fun. I want to wrap up by asking you about these events that you have going on in December. It's a live Zoom event. I think anyone can attend. Can you talk a little bit about it? Because I think some of the listeners would love to attend it. It's called Ancient Philosophy for Modern Leadership. And the Plato's Academy Center runs virtual events separately four times a year um this is our third one and we have we wanted to have loads of speakers at it so we've got 20 different speakers at it including professors of business studies um authors several ceos who are all influenced by ancient philosophy often stoicism like is the most popular one to be honest and it's free although we be good donations are gratefully received because it allows us to carry on doing the same thing in the future and to pay our bills and stuff like that but you you can enroll free of charge we want to make it open to anyone and it's uh yeah like it's a zoom conference on the 3rd of december and you will learn a lot uh, I like these short 10-minute lightning talks because you get to see lots of different perspectives in a, a relatively short space of time. Can I ask, is there a particular person who might be listening that this is better designed for? Or do you think that, because you said for business leadership, so I don't want people to think, oh, well, it won't be useful to me because I don't own a business. Would it still be useful to someone? I think anyone I could potentially benefit from it. Um, anyone that's interested in particular uh, either in business or finance, 
because uh, those are some of the topics that we've got people speaking about, or generally in leadership, um, whether it's – and everybody should be interested in leadership, right? Because apart from – even if you're not a leader, and most people are leaders in some regard. If you're a parent, you're a leader. If you're a teacher, you're a leader. If you're a therapist, you're a leader. If you're a CEO, you're a leader. If you're in government, you're a leader. Like There are many different regards in which people – lead and even if you're not a leader you're a follower like and we're all followers to some regard so it's not like a concept that, that doesn't uh, apply to any of us we, we are the leadership is something that's relevant uh, in two different ways to virtually everybody and socrates you mentioned earlier about the kind of philosophy being taken out into the marketplace and i thought yeah like socrates did right like that's exactly what he was known for and it's also what the, the stoics were known for doing as well is getting everybody like from all walks of life uh, involved in, in doing philosophy. But Socrates, one of the characteristic things about him uh, also was that he thought everybody needed to learn about leadership and he thought it was imperative that we understand the qualities that would be appropriate to a good ruler and he often compared those to the, the qualities required of somebody to be a parent or a teacher. I would love for this conversation to go on for an entirely fresh hour based on what you just said, because I think there's a lot to be said about the need for, if you are going to explore philosophy seriously, the need for a mentor and perhaps how to find them, where to find them. These are all things that I think you probably know better than I do. In fact, I do see some courses on your website. I don't know if those are mentor-mentee relationships or those are just ways of diving into specific texts without having to do the long-form reading yourself. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Because I imagine there's a bunch of benefit there. They don't involve mentoring, but there are like deep dives into Socrates or into Marcus Aurelius. And then there's like a bunch of other little shorter courses as well. It just kind of like commenting on what you said and about we mentioned the importance of this to to stoicism the stoics invented psychotherapy right they they literally talk about it marcus aurelius at the beginning of the meditations said that he received therapia from junius rusticus his main stoic mentor they called it therapy of the the psyche they come within a hair's breadth of just saying psychotherapy and they wrote books on psychotherapy called on therapeutics which are lost now except that we have a book by galen Marcus Aurelius's court physician, who is not a Stoic, he's an eclectic thinker. And Galen wrote a book called On the Diagnosis and Cure of the Soul's Passions, which couldn't sound more like a book on psychotherapy. And, and indeed, there is a book on psychotherapy. And he in it, he he's not a Stoic, but he'd read Chris Ipus's book on therapeutics and is one of our main sources for some of the, the quotes and concepts that come from earlier. Stoic books on psychotherapy. But Galen in that book puts a lot of emphasis on this idea that he thinks in order to experience moral improvement, like with Marcus Aurelius and Junius Rustic, is you need to find a, a mentor. Um, for instance, he says something kind of weird. He says, um, or kind of cool, he says it's better to look for somebody who's older to be your mentor, not because age necessarily brings wisdom, but because it's easier for you to appraise their character because there's more evidence. So if they've lived a longer life, you know, it's potentially easier for you to gauge like what sort of person you're dealing with than if you're trying to judge the character of a, a younger person. So he, whether or not you agree with that, those are the sort of arguments that he comes out with about how you would go about finding an, an appropriate mentor. That's how important it was. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Galius, I hope I'm saying his name right, this is the fellow who you paint the scene in How to Think Like a Roman Stoic. He's on a boat with an unnamed Stoic practitioner or teacher. No, it's a different guy. It's a different guy? That's all as Galius. Um, this this is Galen, um, who's the physician of Marcus Aurelius. Um, all as Galius is a, like a writer. But I would like to finish with this. If you could retell this story, maybe a little bit, the scene on the boat, because I think that one of the things, and maybe even my listeners, as much as I have tried to get them not to feel this way, that one of the things about stoicism is that you can't ever be overcome by passion, that you can't ever be afraid, that you can't ever be, you know, not in perfect control. So th I think this story does a great job at illustrating how that's not true. This is why I have that whole scene in the Verissimus, because what we're told here is so important that it, this story, this anecdote in itself, distinguishes ancient Stoicism from lowercase Stoicism. 
My, it makes it clear what the difference would be. And it was so important to the ancients that Aulus Gellius, this author, picks this anecdote out specifically to illustrate this one point, right? That's how important it was. Like He's like, let me just explain this one key point about Stoicism like, through this story. So it's a weird story. He says that, he, Aulus Gellius says that he himself was on a boat Coming from Athens to Brundisium, the port on the on the Roman coast, um, on the, the coast of Italy, on the way to Rome, and the boat was caught in a storm. This often happened in the ancient world. It's one of the riskiest things you can do, and everybody freaked out, and they all thought they were going to die. And the people were running about, screaming, praying to the gods. Even the the sailors were kind of freaking out a little bit because they genuinely all thought they were going to drown. And Aulus Gellius noticed there was a famous Stoic philosopher who's who he doesn't name, but we could try and guess who he might have been. I think he may have been Apollonius of Chalcedon, incidentally, who was one of the teachers of Marcus Aurelius, but we don't know for sure. So he, he just tells us he was a famous Stoic teacher from Athens, but we're not what his name was. And he noticed this guy was like shaking and turning pale, but he wasn't running around freaking out, right? Um, and then they got to shore, they survived, and they're, they're on the dock, soaked, and all this Gellius and another passenger go up and start kind of questioning this uh, stoic teacher, and, and all this Gellius recognises him and says, listen, I hope you don't mind, but I know you're a famous stoic, and I noticed you, you were kind of looking seasick and nervous and stuff, and aren't stoics meant to be completely imper- impervious to anxiety? Like lowercase s stoicism, like a like you know, like a, a stone, a hearted or a statue. Um, and this guy pulls out a book from one of the lost books of Epictetus and reads it to him and explains to him. So it's like a story within a story within a story. So you tell we get this kind of fragment of Epictetus that we've we've lost now, where Epictetus explains us. And so this guy says to him, no, Stoics have this concept called propathei, like, or proto-passions. It's a hard word to translate into English, but it basically means the automatic or reflex-like emotions. Um, Seneca compares it to somebody sticking their finger in your eye and you having what we call the blink reflex, the corneal reflex. Like, so a reflex-like emotion that we share with animals, non-human animals. So if you jump up behind a dog and go, boo, like it will startle, right? So we have these uh, incipient emotional reactions that are kind of more physiological. If you're caught in a storm and you kind of feel like you're about to die, like it's fairly natural to experience anxiety in this kind of setting. He says even a seasoned sailor would experience some anxiety in that, in that situation. But he says the difference is that a stoic doesn't continue to ruminate about it. Like, he doesn't interpret the feelings in the same catastrophic way. Now, this is so important because it shows that the Stoics thought we have to accept some emotions in a detached way and view them with indifference. And that's the opposite of lowercase Stoicism, which basically people who engage in lowercase Stoicism view anxiety and other unpleasant emotions as bad right? Whereas real Stoics would view them as indifferent or neutral, right? And that's also important because in modern psychotherapy, we know that that this is very similar to the the modern, what we call the revised cognitive model of anxiety. So we know that you have to distinguish between voluntary and involuntary aspects of emotion and accept the involuntary aspects and ride them out without struggling against them or trying to suppress them while taking more responsibility for what happens next, your voluntary uh, rumination or worrying or how you engage or respond to uh, those feelings. So the Stoics had a far more sophisticated understanding of the psychology of emotion than than most people do today. Like It's shocking. Actually, you know, this is a cliched thing to say, but I really mean it. They were way ahead of their time and in terms of their intuitive understanding of emotion. Most normal people today do not have that uh, as sophisticated an understanding of their own emotions as that. And that's why that's one of the things that that leads to emotional vulnerability and, and causes them to lack emotional resilience. Um, so this, the Stoics really understood how emotion work and that there are different 
layers of emotion, different types of emotion. Um, so someone who's a lowercase stoic, not understanding that, we just think emotions are bad, anxiety is bad, you know, I need to kind of repress it or use alcohol to cope with it or, or conceal it from other people or something like that. And that will tie you in knots because some of those emotions are involuntary in nature, or what we, we call them in psychology automatic uh, thoughts and feelings. And trying to struggle against them actually tends to make them worse. So what you think you know about stoicism, you probably don't know correctly. And you might get better at knowing if you read some of Donald's books to include How to Think Like a Roman Emperor and the new graphic novel, Verissimus, which is everywhere, right? We can get it in bookstores. We can get it on Amazon. You can get it from anywhere that sells books, is what the publishers like to say. And if I could thank you, because I thought that How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, I was so worried, because I consume a lot by audiobook, because often I have to consume an entire book in just the few days before an interview, and it's impossible for me to find the read time to do that. I was so thankful that you narrated it, because so many people are uncomfortable narrating their own books. I think they get self-conscious about their voice, and I'm so glad that you did not, because you have a, a great voice to listen to for a long period of time, and it comes across as a very uh, academic mentory kind of voice which is pleasant for that kind of material so it was a really enjoyable listen surprisingly hard work to narrate a book but i'm glad that i did oh yeah <laughs> it's even <laughs> it's even worse to edit it <laughs> hopefully you didn't have to do that yourself donald this has been a blast i've really enjoyed getting to know you a bit and sharing some of your viewpoints with my listeners thank you for being here yeah, it's been a pleasure thank you very much I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Donald Robertson. I know that I did. If you would check the show notes of this episode for links to his book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, and his new graphic novel, Verissimus, as well as links to his website and all the places you can find him, he is most certainly a person you should be familiar with, and now you are, and whom you should go on to follow and pay attention to throughout your future journey as a Prokopton on the Stoic Path. Again, thanks for listening, and until next time, take care. <laughs>